Greetings, everyone. Welcome to the Pasadena Seventh-day Adventist Church Worship Hour. We are so glad that you have tuned in to watch our church service on this beautiful Sabbath morning to come and worship with us in spirit and truth. We're so grateful for those of you who are watching from near and also far. I just want to welcome our church family and all of you who are watching us today. Today, I'd like to just share a word of encouragement with you, and that is to let you know that our God is still on the throne, and he has you and all of us in his hands. So we want you to receive a special blessing today, and we know that God has already heard your petition. He's going to answer your prayer of your need, especially those that you're praying for. We pray that you will receive the blessing you stand in need of today, and we want to just let you know that we have a few announcements for you today, and the first one is that we are having different ministries, the virtual ministries that are taking place uh, as we're continuing our ministry here in this vineyard. On Friday evening, we have the health presentation. Um, we want you to participate in that. It's very rich. And then, of course, we have the Bible study that takes place as well. On Sabbath morning, this morning, you should have been able to join in with the Sabbath school classes, also with the little children, our children's Sabbath school, as well as our adult Sabbath school. Then, of course, you have a message today by yours truly. And then this afternoon, there will be another Bible study as well. And then uh, I believe that Steps to Christ Bible study. Then we have a youth meeting as well on the virtual. Uh, you can go to our website, check out the homepage of the website, and you'll see just below the sermon of the day all of the particular ministries that is going on today. Um, today, we will not be having the... Uh, Pastor, ask the pastor form. There will be a virtual graduation at Andrews that I will be participating in um, Sabbath afternoon. So therefore, we won't have the ask the pastor this coming um, afternoon. So we want you to sit back and enjoy yourself and have a special blessing. Also, I want to remind you of Wednesday evening prayer meeting. Uh, we've been averaging about 15 people on our prayer line on Wednesday nights. Please join us. You'll see the link and also the call number on our website. And then for those of you, and that's on Wednesday at 7 p.m., and for those of you who'd like to continue to sending your tithe and also returning your tithe and offering, please do that by going on our website and click on the link, uh, online giving. You can do it there, or if you're not computer literate and you prefer to mail it, please mail it to the church's address. May God continue to bless us as we worship him in spirit and truth, and we know that you'll receive a blessing today. What a blessing it is to come together despite the distance between us as you worship at home with us on this beautiful Sabbath day. We ask that the Lord's presence will be with you. And so as we start this worship service, I would like to invite you to open your Bibles to 1 Chronicles chapter 16. And we will be reading verses 23 through 29. 1 Chronicles 16, 23 through 29. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his wonders among all peoples. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is also to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and gladness are in his place. Give to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Give to the Lord glory and strength. Give to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. O worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness. I invite you now to kneel with me as we offer prayer. Our most gracious, loving Heavenly Father, thank you once again for bringing us together in spirit and in truth. O oh Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit will be in the midst of us, whether we're here at church or far away in our homes. 
May we feel his presence. May our hearts be open to your leading today. O oh Lord, may our hearts be receptive to the message that you have in store for us. We pray for you to be with Pastor Johnson as he breaks the bread, that we may be encouraged, that we may be inspired, and that we may be uh, hopeful and to be ready to receive all the blessings that you have in store for us this beautiful Sabbath day. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your forgiveness. And thank you for the hope that we have in Jesus and in his soon return. May you be glorified and be honored as we worship you today. For we ask in his name. Amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath, church. It is such a blessing that I can be part of uh, this online Sabbath today. And um, even though that we're stuck inside through this trial, um, God has blessed us with some amazing weather as we come into the summer. So we just remind ourselves that um, through these hard times that there's sunshine. So um, please sing with me uh, hymn number 470, There's Sunshine in My Soul Today. So if you have a hymn, hymn number 470, and if you want to look it up online, there's sunshine in my soul today. There is sunshine in my soul today, more glorious and bright than glows in any earthly sky, for Jesus is my light. Oh, there's sunshine, blessed sunshine. When the peaceful, happy moments roll, when Jesus shows his smiling face, there is sunshine in my soul. There's music in my soul today, a carol to my King. And Jesus, listening, can, can hear the songs I cannot sing. Oh, there's sunshine, blessed sunshine, when the peaceful, happy moments roll. When Jesus shows his smiling face, there is sunshine in my soul. There is springtime in my soul today, for when the Lord is near, the dove of peace sings in my heart, the flowers of grace appear. There is sunshine, blessed sunshine, when the peaceful, happy moments roll. When Jesus shows his smiling face, there is sunshine in my soul. There is gladness in my soul today, and hope and praise and love for blessings which He gives me now, for joys laid up above. Oh, there's sunshine, blessed sunshine. When the peaceful, happy moments roll, when Jesus shows his smile.
smiling face. There is sunshine in the soul. Please uh, sing with me for our opening song. If you have a hymn, um, hymn number 15, My Maker and My King. My Maker and My King. My maker and my king, to thee my all I owe. Thy sovereign bounty is the spring whence all my blessings flow. Thy sovereign bounty is the spring whence all my blessings flow. of thy hand on the alone I live my God thy benefits demand more praise than I can give my God thy benefits demand more praise than I can give Lord, what can I impart when all is thine before? Thy love demands a thankful heart, the gift, alas, how poor. Thy love demands a thankful heart, the gift, alas, how poor. Let thy grace inspire my soul with strength divine. Let every word and each desire and all my days be thine. Let every word and each desire and all my days This is the Gardener prayer time. And this is a special time because I don't know about you, but for me, I love talking to my God. I love talking to Jesus and bringing him all of my concerns and burdens. I praise the Lord for being a God that's always there. And one of the favorite texts that I can remember is that he says before you call I will answer and I'm so grateful for that what about you so this morning church family and friends and loved ones from near and far I'd like for you to think about the things that you have on your heart today and and I'd like for you to join in with me as we all kneel no matter where you are to lift up our petitions to the father this morning God of heaven, O oh Lord, O oh Lord, thank you so much for remembering us today to give us life that was not promised. And therefore, because you have raised us up today, we have a purpose within this day, and we pray even thus far we have not dishonored your name in any way. We come by faith, Lord, asking for forgiveness of sin, trespasses, iniquities, we come by faith knowing that without you, we can do nothing. So, Lord, please give us your Holy Spirit. Pour out your power upon us as never before. Help us, Lord, to receive the blessing today that we stand in need of. And, oh, God of heaven, as our faces differ, so does all of our petitions and concerns. 
and we know that you have them already on your heart and mind, you can handle the whole load. So we give it over to you this morning with no strings attached. We're asking, oh God, that you will bless in a very special way those who are challenged with their health right now. Those who are sick and shut in of our church family, our friends and loved ones afar. We pray that you would touch them, being the great physician that you are, O God of heaven, and heal them according to thine will. And for those who have been challenged with this pandemic of COVID-19, we pray that you will heal, O God, and also protect from anyone receiving it. We know, O God, that you sit high and you, and you look low and you know the end from the beginning. Lord, we place our lives in your hands. So we lift up our young people and we lift up them in a very special way because the enemy wants to take them out and use them for his cause. We're asking, oh God, that you will pour out your spirit upon them. As you said in your word in Joel 2, you would pour out your spirit upon all flesh. Bless them as well to be a light, a beacon light for you in such a time as this. We pray for our church family at large and all of their concerns and we pray for the leadership here and we pray, oh God, that the ministry and mission that you've placed on our hearts to move forward in, even with the crises at hand, that it will flourish and bring glory to your name. So we pray for all the Bible study interests as well. We pray that your spirit will go before the Bible studies and before we connect with them, oh God, and make them ripe fruit ready to be harvested. And oh God of heaven, there are many other things that we want to lift up and those people who who have concerns about finances, oh God, we pray that you would touch, touch their lives and bless them. Bless the relationships that are faltering right now, Lord. Heal men. Reconcile our brothers and sisters by your spirit. And oh God of heaven, as we conclude this prayer, there are many things that I'm sure we're missing to ask this morning, but we're asking you now, Lord, to answer every petition of need even those things that we have failed to ask. So therefore, fail not to grant thank you. And when you shall come in the clouds of glory, take us home with you. And, O oh Lord, bless your word today that it will be, be, be heard and not fall upon deaf ears. And we're asking, O oh God, that you will bless beyond measure, that we may be a blessing to others. This we pray in your Son, Christ Jesus' name, we thank you. Let the church say amen. Amen. And amen. Troublesome times, Troublesome times are here Filling men's, filling hearts, men's hearts with fear Freedom we, Freedom all, we all hold dear now is it Freedom's stay. now at stake Humbling your hearts, Humbling your hearts to God, God. Saves from the, Saves chasing. From the chasing rod Seek the way, Seek the way pilgrims God. trod Christians away Jesus is, Jesus is coming soon Morning or night, Morning or, night or noon Many will meet their doom. Trumpets will, Trumpets will surely sound. All of the dead, of the dead shall rise. Righteous meet, righteous meet in the skies. Going where, no going where no one dies. Heavenward bound. Troubles will soon be o'er. Happy forevermore. When we meet on that shore. Free from all, free care. From all worldly care. Rising up in, in the sky. This world goodbye, goodbye. We then, then we'll fly glory to share Jesus is Jesus coming, is coming. Troublesome, times Troublesome times are here Filling men's, filling hearts, men's hearts with fear Freedom we, Freedom all, we all hold dear now is it Freedom's stay. now at stake Humbling your hearts, Humbling your hearts to God, God. Saves from the chasing God Christians away Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming soon Morning or night, Morning or night or Trumpets will surely sound. All of the dead, 
shall rise Righteous meet in the skies Going where no one dies Heavenward bound Troubles will soon be o'er Happy forevermore When we meet on that shore Free from all care Free from all worldly care Rising up in the sky Telling this world goodbye then we'll fly glory to share Jesus is, Jesus coming, is coming soon morning or, night, morning or night or noon Many will many meet, will meet their, their doom Trumpets will sound Trumpets will surely sound by the Emmanuel Quartet. Praise God for those powerful singers from Israel. I thank God for that wonderful music. Thank you, gentlemen. What a great testimony and song. I could not have asked for a better title or a better message and song to be rendered before the message today. It only tells me one thing, that God's in charge. And he ordained the message in song today. My prayer is that the message from his word today is no different. Beloved, we are so grateful to have this opportunity to come and share the word of God with you again. And we know right now we're living in such a time that is so unprecedented. The signs of the times are all about us, brothers and sisters, and we can see that our Lord and Savior is soon to come. And as the brothers were singing the song, I was reminded, oh yes, he's coming. I praise God for this opportunity, and I'm not worthy in any sense, but I'm simply willing. But I want to get down to God's business this morning because there's a lot on the plate. There's so much on this particular plate of this message that I can't see the plate. So I want to get started and begin this way. Those of you who have your Bibles, would you travel with me to the book of Luke chapter 21? And we want to take a look at verses 25 to 28. That's Luke chapter 21, verses 25 to 28. And the word of God shares it this way. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, meaning men would not know what to do, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. In verse 27, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. God's message to all of us, especially myself today, this morning is entitled, The Handwriting on the Wall. Would you pray with me? Father, in the name of Jesus, 
take charge. Bind the enemy of souls. Have your way, O God. Bless in a very special way that we may gain the message today that we will understand your will and never, never, never forget what time it is. So we're asking that you will bind the enemy and give us the focus that we need. And, O oh God of heaven, help us and bless us that we may be a blessing to others. This we pray in Jesus' name. Let everyone say, Amen. Beloved, I want to focus on the coming of our Lord and the end of this world. And you know, for too many years, too little has been said or even spoken about the second coming of Jesus from the poor pits across the land. However, but in the last two months or so, you can rest assured more and more preachers now are now beginning to preach it. There are those who go to the even to the extreme and they now even try to predict the date when the Lord shall return and when it shall be the end of this world. But most of us now have seen the signs and heard some say the world is going to end on a certain day. I want to settle that right now. The Bible tells us in Matthew 24, 36, but of that day and hour no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my father only. He's the only one that knows that day and hour, brothers and sisters. We don't know, but we can see the signs, and the signs tells us today that his coming is very near. Notice what else God says in Matthew 13, looking at verse 16 and 17. But blessed are your eyes, for they see what's going on. Yes, your ears, they hear what's going on. Yes, the signs are the times. For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see and have not seen them. And to hear those things which you hear and have not heard them. God says these individuals in his day, in Jesus' day, they would have loved to see what we see today. But many people today take it lightly. It's not a big deal. You see, brothers and sisters, we are seeing and hearing all of these prophetic things that are happening today that was proclaimed by Jesus long time ago. The prophets and the disciples were so anxious for Christ to come. Please, are you coming next week? No, the signs of the time must take place. They would have loved to see what we see today, brothers and sisters. Oh, yes. And even though I must say these signs are everywhere about us today, again, no one knows the day nor the hour. But we can see that it's very close even at the doors. So the Bible says we will know when it is near, as I mentioned earlier in Matthew chapter 24, looking at that great text there in verse 33. You see, Jesus gave many signs, brothers and sisters. Yes, he did. And some of the chapters of the Bible deals almost exclusively with signs that are in the time of the end. He talked about these signs. And there in Matthew chapter 24, it's one of them, which we will come back to. It's loaded with what we're going to deal with today. And Revelation chapter 6 is another chapter that deals with the signs. And of course, what we've read, Luke chapter 21, also. Brothers and sisters, I have to say, the Lord has given all of us. He has said, I have given you these signs because you are children of light. God doesn't want all of us, his children, to be children of darkness. No, when we know him because he is the light, we ought to be children of light. What do you say? And that day should not come upon us unawares. It should not sneak up upon us where we're not knowing that it's happening, brothers and sisters. God says, oh, no, not my children. Please understand, beloved, the Lord is coming, whether we believe it or not. The signs that show his coming is near as fast fulfilling year by year, month by month, day by day. These signs are happening that's telling us this thing is almost over. In other words, the jig is almost up. I want to tell you that God bears long with his children. Oh, yes, he does, because he could have come a long time ago, but he has not come. And there are some who say that he's coming. If he's coming, why hasn't he come yet? 
But God always liked to come back with his wonderful, powerful scriptures in 2 Peter 3, 9, where he says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, what's not willing that any should perish. God doesn't want anybody to die, but that all should come to repentance. He wants to save everybody. You mean to tell me the little rascals that even breaks into churches? Yes, he wants to save them from their sins. He wants to redeem them as well. Nobody has anything over one another. The ground is level at the foot of the cross, especially when it comes to God's heart. He wants to save us all. He loves us all. We need to get that fixed in our mind. So please never throw anyone else away. You see, God is so merciful and so good. Oh, yes, he is. And he loves us desperately, so desperately he loves us that he refused to, repun- he refused to punish the guilty without giving warnings, you see. And therefore, brothers and sisters, he gives us these warnings so that we can have a way of escape out of damnation, if you please. You see, the Lord has always sent a warning message to every doomed generation. He gave warnings before the flood. We talked about that. Beloved, We need to understand God will not forever tolerate impenitent sinners. Oh, no, sinners who wants to continue to sin and go forward and do all kind of things and think that they're going to make heaven anyhow just because they believe in John 316 or they can quote it. Oh, no, it does not work that way. The time of judgment will come, brothers and sisters, and it is looming over the earth right now. It shall take place. You see, all of the generations have backslidden and have had their warning. Many of them, many of us have grown up in the church and have lost our way and went out into the far country and the Lord tapped us on the church shoulder with some circumstance and we found our way back. Praise God for that mercy. We've backslidden, many have, but now we're back. And that's why when we see those who have backslidden in the church, we need to be praying and fasting for them. Don't give up on them. God didn't give up on you. We shouldn't give up on them. Come on and say amen. And this represents, this presentation, brothers and sisters, lets us know that that there's a great warning that is looming over the earth right now. Now, where did I get the idea of this this handwriting on the wall, this title? Well, I'd like to direct your attention to Daniel chapter 5. Those of you who study your Bibles know this story all too well the book of Daniel, and the destruction of Babylon at that particular time. This now was preceded by the hand of God's judgment on a wall. Again, the story is found there in Daniel chapter 5. And in this story, it is a story of a king whose name was Belshazzar. And notice what the Bible says in Daniel 5.1. Belshazzar, the king, made a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before the thousand. Beloved, that is the first clue of why God moved with such exacting judgment against Belshazzar and the great kingdom kingdom of Babylon. What is that? The Bible tells us something about him in every in the very first verse right there where he is introduced. He decided to have a feast, but there's nothing wrong with a feast. Come on and say amen. Most of us have a feast every day. We eat, don't we? Especially after church. The problem is when men go to the excess where they dishonor the Lord. And the excess in verse 1 is that he had intemperance. He had intemperance, eating and drinking, and he wasn't drinking water. That was a problem. Are you listening now? He was drinking now intoxicating beverages. Well, God says we'll let you have your way, but he did something that really dishonored God. The kingdom was given over to drunkenness because they were all in a stupor. Nearly every big shot army officer, navy officer, and everybody who was somebody in the kingdom of Babylon was there, and they came to the palace to get drunk. How can men respect and understand their need of God when their minds is all destroyed by liquor? How could it be? God wants us to have a clear mind, brothers and sisters, in these last days. Oh, yes. So you won't miss what's really going on. Oh, yeah. The devil knows that. So in Daniel chapter 5, 2 and 3, the word of God gives us this counsel. Belshazzar, while he tasted the wine, 
commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple which was in Jerusalem that the king and his princes, his wives, and his concubines might drink therein. Uh-oh. He went and got the golden vessels from the temple, God's golden vessels. Verse 3, then they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God, which was at Jerusalem, and the king and his princes, his wives, and the concubines drank from them. Have mercy. Now we see the second principle, sin of Babylon, added to intemperance. It was the sin of no respect for sacred things. Even the house of God, even today, there are people, like I mentioned earlier, that will break into churches. There are people who will rob churches when they lift the offering. There are no respect for sacred things. God will bring judgment. You see, earlier, brothers and sisters, Nebuchadnezzar had overthrown. He had, he had conquered Babylon. Oh, yeah, God's people. And when he arrived at the temple of Jerusalem, which is God's house, he found those sacred vessels which God had dedicated to himself. And they brought them back when they destroyed and took over Jerusalem. And since they were made out of gold, Nebuchadnezzar was full of himself with gold. He took them all home with him as a bounty of war. But in chapter four, God dealt with this man. And we find that Nebuchadnezzar became acquainted with the true God and became converted turned now into an animal crawling for seven years with his, his nails and his toenails growing out with great claws, hair matted like a beast in the field. God touched him. That's why just pray for people. God can reach them. Come on and say amen. Well, let me tell you the rest of the story. So here it is. In this great feast, Belshazzar and all of his crowd there Worshiping him and giving him the glory for having such a great feast. And all of a sudden, there broke out a hand beginning to write, a sleeveless hand began to write on the wall. And Belshazzar, according to the story, his knees smote together when he saw this. In other words, he was about to wet himself. He was so afraid. And when he saw the fingers writing on the wall, he began to see what it was writing, but he could not understand what it was, what it meant. And he began now to ask all of his astrologers and soothsayers, all these people who are supposed to be magicians to tell different fortunes and can interpret things. And they could not. But then there was a woman. There was a woman that came out and she says, look, I know a man. See, a man is not just one who put on pants. Come on and say amen. A man is a man who stands for truth, though the heavens fall. Daniel was a man compared to all of the others. He came in and he interpreted the dream. But before he did, not the dream, excuse me, the handwriting on the wall. Before he did, Belshazzar says, hey, whoever, whoever can, can, can interpret this handwriting on the wall, I will make you third ruler in the kingdom. I will give you a chain around your neck, which is a badge of honor and make you third ruler, Daniel comes in, he hears that, and he says, keep your rank, keep your jewels, keep all of that. I don't want that. Keep that for yourself, but I'll tell you what it means. So here in Daniel chapter 5, 5, the word of God gives the counsel. In the same hour forth came forth the fingers of a man's hand and wrote over the, against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace, and the king saw part of the hand that wrote and therefore, in Daniel chapter 5, 24 to 28, it gives us this counsel. Then was the part of the hand sent from him, and the writing was written. And this is the writing that was written. Meany, meany, tekel you for sin. This is the interpretation of the thing. Meany, God has numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tekel, thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. Paris, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians, right at that same hour, all of these soldiers is all drunk in the great feast. They even left the gates open. And now here it is. Here it is. This young man, Cyrus, who was appointed by God, he came and they drained the moat down and they crawled under the gate. But when they got to kept, crawled under the fence, excuse me, the wall, should I say. And when they got to the gate, they were so drunk, they had left the gate wide open and they went in and took out 
Babylon. Oh, beloved, this nation, Babylon, committed national apostasy. The God of heaven, which brought about national ruin. In other words, when we commit or a nation commits national apostasy, God will bring national ruin. Stay with me. We're going somewhere with that. And their kingdom was overtaken by the Medes and the Persians. And God foretold this would happen. There he says Cyrus would come. I appointed him. In Isaiah 45, 1, he says he's going to go and they're going to be so drunk the gates will be open. He's going to go right in and take over that country, take over that kingdom. See, God sees the end from the beginning, brothers and sisters. Stay with me because we're going to go somewhere that's going to get so heavy you can't lift it. They would be so drunk they, wouldn't, they would leave the gate open and the handwriting on the wall told their doom. Beloved, please understand this whole world, this whole world is spiritual Babylon. That's what it is. What is it? She's turned her back on God, especially the United States of America. Yes, this nation has made laws which directly oppose now the laws of God. And you know that's a no-no. Yes, which has led this nation to lead the world, influenced now by Rome, to commit national apostasy against God. You see, my brothers and sisters, please stay with me today. Just like the Babylon of old committed national apostasy against the God of heaven and ended up in national ruin. This nation, the United States, as it leads the rest of the world, influenced by Rome, is headed towards national ruin. And I'm coming back to this point, so stay with me. Stay tuned. And as I mentioned earlier, brothers and sisters, Jesus gave the signs when his coming is near. And we find that in the great book, Matthew chapter 24, looking at verses 1 to 14. The word of God gives us this counsel. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. They looked at it, ooh, isn't this nice? And Jesus had to correct him. And Jesus said unto them, see ye? Not all these things, verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately saying, hey, tell us when shall these things be and what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ. And shall deceive many. And we've seen that even in our day. In verse 6. And ye shall hear wars of rumors of wars. And ye shall, ye shall see and be not troubled. Don't be troubled when you see this. For all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. This is the sign of the end coming. For nations shall rise against nation. And kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences. Which we're experiencing right now. And earthquakes in divers or different places. All these things now are the beginning of sorrows. What? I thought it was bad right now. It's getting bad, but it's the beginning of sorrows, the word of God says. And in verse 9, and they shall deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another. What? This is what's going to happen? And shall hate one another? Yes. And many false prophets shall arise and deceive many. We talked about that. Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many will wax cold. People are cold, even in churches. Cold-hearted, cold-blooded, you name it. But he that endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And Christ told them, his disciples at that time, this gospel has to go forward. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world as a witness unto all nations. And then the end shall come. It didn't say everybody was going to accept. But when this gospel goes and touch the minds of everybody, introduce, if you please, then the end shall come. It didn't say everybody was going to accept it. So when you go out and you pass out a track, brothers and sisters, success, 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 the gospel is going out. What do you say? And I want to remind everybody in this particular prophecy in Matthew chapter 24, it's a dual prophecy. It was the destruction of Jerusalem and the end of this world. Now let the sermon begin. Beloved, since 9-11, our freedoms have been diminished. 
Now with COVID-19, every person in this world is now in subjection to lose their freedom. Oh yes, you see there's a new normal that they're talking about even in the Philippines right now. They're talking about how things are gonna be. In other words, even when this so-called pandemic is supposed to go away, which now we're hearing in the media that it may, may last 18, to two, 18 months to two years. What? We can't stand six months. This world will turn upside down with chaos, but it's talking about lasting longer now. But now, all over the world, and especially now in the Philippines, is talking about getting adjusted now to the new norm. What would that be like where we are today? And then in CNN, it talks about the new normal as well. In other words, they're giving us the hint, brothers and sisters, that things are not going back to normal. It's not going to be the same. We are going to have, our res we're going to have restrictions placed upon us. We won't be able to do what we used to do. And I would be blessed in a very, very powerful way to know that we can come back and worship like we used to. I'm wondering if we'll ever be able to come back and crowd the church but one day, God is going to fix this thing, and it's on track to do just that. But right now, they're talking about a new normal, letting us know it's not going to be the same. And make no mistake about it, this pandemic is a major tool in the leaders of this world's hand to bring about the so long coveted one world order. Yes. Let's take a look at some history then. And we see President Bush when this thing took place in 9-11, September 11, 1990, he points out something in one of his presentation. He talks about the New World Order and Congress promoted it. Not only that, but Clinton followed in his footsteps. Yes, he did. Saying there in 1993, January 1, he's going to continue the push for the New World Order. Yes. And then they put together and had a committee come together not long ago since Trump been in office. Yes, they put the committee together to save the new world order. Keep it going on the course that they have it on so that it can come to pass. What's it all about? You'll hear about it. Stay with me. And now because Trump may have sat on that committee, he himself is also doing the same thing, laying the groundwork for a new world order built around the U.S. and China and Russia. This is what's going on, brothers and sisters. This pandemic, it is being used for something big. This is not happenstance. We've had viruses before. We've had pandemics before. This is the only one being used, and this is the only one that has touched everybody on the top side of this earth. This new world order will bring about a one world financial system a one world food and water system? Oh, yes. Pope Francis even has gone far to even say what he's going to do. He invites religious political leaders to sign a global pact. This is coming up on May 14th this year for human, new humanism, he calls it. Talking about educational, but wrapped up in that is to sign a pact for a one world order. Education, one world order education moving very stealthily, trying to bring it all together. Rome is behind the scenes pushing this. Don't think they don't have anything to do with what's going on with this pandemic. There's something going on here, brothers and sisters. Stay with me. You're going to see something. A one world day of worship led by the United States and influenced by Rome is looming on the horizon. Yes, a national Sunday law. Notice what it says here in the great book, Revelation chapter 13, 11 through 18. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth and had two horns like a lamb and spake as a dragon. And he exercised all the power of the first beast before him and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Let me make it plain. This is the United States who's paying homage to Rome, making an image to Rome to do her bidding. Yes. Verse 13, and he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by the sword and did live. 
They received a deadly wound, but this wound is being healed daily, brothers and sisters. And soon, when that national Sunday law is hit, brothers and sisters, the deadly wound will be completely healed. We got to understand something here. And there in verse 15, and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And then in verse 17, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that have understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and it is, his number is six hundred three score and six. Let's deal with something here. You can't buy and sell? What do you mean? How so? Notice what's going on with this pandemic, this virus. There are restrictions, brothers and sisters, going on with the social gathering and even restrictions even in the workplace. Someone asked me to pray for them because they wouldn't let them go back to work unless they got tested. They're going to stretch that. They're going to come up with other things, too, where you can't buy or sell. You can't go to work unless you comply with the system. This pandemic is being used as a tool to bring about something huge, and we know behind it is the One World Order and the National Sunday Law. Many cannot return to work unless they get tested for the virus. Sounds like a good thing, right? For the health reasons and safety with health, right? Yeah, but it appears that this may be the requirement for everybody, everyone, to be tested, period, or face stiff penalties. And well, along with this test, there's some stuff that's coming. You won't be able to go to work or getting access to essential needs like food, oh, you can't come in here, you haven't been tested. Can you see this? Uh-huh. So what is proposed to monitor that you've been tested? Talking about restarting the community, the e economy. What did it say? I'm getting all this, I did a whole bunch of research, so stay with me. To restart the economy, employees need to lead the way of COVID-19 testing and vaccination. This is dated April 13, 2020. It's here. And then, of course, by getting tested, they want to go along right with that, the RFID chip. Uh-huh. Radio frequency identification. So they'll know, yeah, that one's been tested. Nope, that one hasn't. Frequency. Be able to tell who's been tested, who hasn't been tested. But along with this, it has all kind of information in it, and then it allows you to buy and sell all those things. No, it is not the mark of the beast. I'll deal with that in a moment. And then guess who's behind it as well? They're trying to hide him behind everything, but he's, he's been doing some stuff. Yeah, Bill Gates. Uh-huh. It says he will use the microchip implants to fight the coronavirus. What? Really? Oh, you got to get tested so we can, we, we got to get tested. Then you have to take the chip so we can monitor to know who has been tested and who has not. And if you don't go along with it, you're in trouble. This was put out there on the 19th of March, 2020. Beloved, please understand, stay with me now. This virus is a key player in leading the world into a new world order. And again, when the National Sunday Law is pronounced, the beast power of Rome has always stated that Sunday is their ecclesiastical mark of their authority. Uh-huh, yes. Notice what Cardinal Gibbons had to say. Cardinal Gibbons, faith of our fathers. You may read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and you will not find a single line authorizing the sanctification of Sunday. The scriptures enforce the religious observance of Saturday, a day which we, the Catholic Church, never sanctify. Again, the Catholic Church, by virtue of her divine mission, changed the day from Saturday to Sunday. The Catholic Mirror, official publications of James Cardinal Gibbons. It goes on to say 
And the next thought here, it says here, Protestants do not realize that by observing Sunday, they accept the authority of the spokesperson of the church, the Pope, our Sunday visitor. Oh, yes. Of course, the Catholic Church claims that the change Saturday to Sunday, Saturday Sabbath to Sunday was her act. Oh, yes. And the act is a mark of her ecclesiastical authority in religious things. The Catholic Church claims that the church is above the Bible. And this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. Wow. So here it is. A whole nation, they tell you, this is what we've done. And all the world wonders after the beast. Revelation 13, 3. Notice what else the Roman leader says. He goes on connecting Sunday keeping with a better environment. Oh, this environment is like this because God is mad at us. We have this pandemic because God is mad at us. We have all, it's all messed up. So, so we need a day of rest in Jesus and God. Sunday keeping with a better environment. This deals with climate change no, known as global warming. And he goes on to say, notice what he says here. He says, the Pope connects the environment with Sunday keeping. On Sunday, our participation in the Eucharist has special importance. Sunday, like the Jewish Sabbath, is meant to be a day which heals our relationships with God, with ourselves, with others, and with the world. Sunday is the day of resurrection, the first day of the new creation, whose first fruits are the Lord's risen humanity, the pledge of the final transfiguration of all created reality. It also proclaims man's eternal rest in God. In this way, Christian spirituality incorporates the value of relaxation, relaxation and festivity. This is the last act of the drama that's coming up, brothers and sisters. And notice this counsel from the pen of inspiration. She said, never did this message apply with greater force than it applies today. More and more, the world is setting at naught the claims of God. Men have become bold in their transgression. The wickedness of the inhabitants of the world has almost filled up the measure of their iniquity. This earth has almost reached the place where God will permit the destroyer to work his will upon it. It goes on to say the substitution of the laws of men for the law of God, the exaltation by merely human authority of Sunday in place of the Bible Sabbath is the last act in the drama. When this substitution becomes universal, God will reveal himself. He will arise in his majesty to, majesty to shake terribly the earth. He will come out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the world for their iniquity. And the earth shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. Brothers and sisters, we are there. We, it's creeping up on us right now. We're told that when this happens, we ought not wait until it does. Wait for what? We should flee to the rural places and to the countries. We should flee from the large cities. Oh, yes. Notice what it says in Matthew 24, looking at verse 15 to 20. And when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Now in Daniel 9, 27, because it's talked about Daniel speaking of the abomination of desolation, it's speaking of Rome, abomination of desolation. To make this even more clear, that this is speaking about Rome, the parallel text is right here in, in Luke 21, where it says in verse 20 and 21, and when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of, of it depart out, and let not them that are in the countries enter therein too. Now let's look at verse 16 of Matthew 24 again. Then let them which be in Judea flee to the mountains. Let them which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Nope. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. Time to go. And woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Here God tells us something, brothers and sisters. Please get this. He tells his children to flee the city 
when we see the abomination of desolation stand in the holy place. In the destruction of Jerusalem, Christ warned them to leave the cities when the banners of Rome were placed in the soil around Jerusalem. And there in AD 66, Cestius Gallus marched against Jerusalem for some unknown reason. Here they are. They're out there. And the Jews are right there with their soldiers and they're waiting to go to battle. And Christ told them, when you see the abomination of desolation stand in the holy place, Jerusalem is the holy place, brothers and sisters, that it's referring to. When you see that abomination of desolation, meaning Rome standing in the holy place, flee. But they couldn't flee because Cestius and his army was surrounding the city. But for some unknown reason, Cestius now retreated with his army and left. And some of those Jews took off after them and began to kill and slaughter some of the Romans in behind their brigade. But then, about three and a half years later, here it is, Titus now. Titus comes back now in A.D. 70. The Roman emperor returns and surrounds the city. And then Jerusalem is sieged and destroyed. But everybody that listened to the voice of God that got out of that city when those first army retreated with Cestius, they were safe. They got out of the city. They got away from the big city. They got out in their country. But then three and a half years later, here comes Titus and they sacked Jerusalem and destroyed the temple. This is what happened, brothers and sisters. Let's parallel this to our day now. Let's take a look at this thing. The National Sunday Law is pronounced. When it's pronounced, flee the cities. That's the abomination of desolation. Notice the counsel from country living. The signal for fleeing the cities. It is no time now for God's people to be fixing their affections or laying up their treasure in the world. The time is not far distant when, like the early disciples, we shall be forced to seek a refuge in desolate and solitary places. As the siege of Jerusalem by the Roman armies was the signal for flight to the Judean Christians, so the assumption of power on the part of our nation in decreeing enforcing papal, the papal Sabbath will be a warning to us. It goes on to say, it will be then, it will then be time to leave the large cities. Are we listening today? Preparatory to leaving the smaller ones for retired homes in the secluded smaller ones for retired homes and secluded places among the mountains. And now, instead of seeking expensive dwellings right here in a big city, we should be preparing to move to a better country, even a heavenly country. Instead of spending our means in self-gratification, we should be studying to economize, economize, and that's what we should be doing. Country Living, page 32. We should leave the cities to live off what I call the Eden plan. What is it? Self-sustaining properties in the country, off the grid. You may move out there and you're not off the grid, but you can work towards it. But God tells us to get out and it'll be good for us to get out before the decree happens. It'll be good before, for us to get out before the decree happens. Right now, because of this pandemic, you'd be surprised how many people that I even know that is calling me about all kinds of things that has to do with everybody seeking a country property. They see the signs. They see it. They see it's getting ready to hit, brothers and sisters. And here's the thing. Get this. Please don't forget this. If you're in the city, you know what it says, that you receive the mark of the beast in your hand or in your forehead. Let me tell you something. If you're in the cities, you're going to be forced to accept the system or die on the spot. You and your children. You're going to go along with it. The pressure will be too great if you're still here. And we know that the time will come where we have to go to the mountains and caves. But he's telling us right now in this council, when we see these things taking place right before our very eyes, brothers and sisters, we need to get out of the cities right now. Get out in of the cities and go out to where we can grow our own food and we can have our own water wells and electricity and our heating system. Yes, God will lead us to do just that. Notice what it says, preparing for the Sunday law, brothers and sisters. 
Preparing for the Sunday law crises, troublous times before us, country living, page 20. We are not to locate ourselves where we will be forced into those close relations with those who do not honor God. A crisis is soon to come in regard to the observance of Sunday. The Sunday party is strengthening itself in the false claims, and this will mean oppression to those who determine to keep the Sabbath of the Lord. We are to place ourselves where we can carry out the Sabbath commandment in its fullness. And then it goes on to say, in the providence of God, we can secure places away from the cities. The Lord would have us do this. There are troublous times before us. But let me make it plainer right here so you can be at ease. God will speak to each and every one of us individually and our families collectively. When to go, where to go, how to go. These counsels, is, this also warns against acting even rashly. Just because you hear this, don't jump up and run out of here and say, hey, I got to go and find a place right now. Pray fast. Ask God which way to go, when to go. He'll provide a way how to go. Yes. So it's a warning against acting rashly, not sensible. Each person or family should study the instruction. Think and pray about it. Yes. Identify, evaluate even all of the options that you have. And ask God to make his leading clear. That's what you want to do. Why? We, mo we must obey the counsel which says in Matthew chapter 24 as we continue. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of time to this time, no shall ever be. A time is coming, brothers and sisters, pen cannot portray. Yes, there were persecution earlier on in the dark ages, but it's talking about a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. And then it says in verse 22, and except those days should be shortened, there shall, should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. God says, they got to cut it shorter. Some of my people will give up and turn back. I got I to help them. I got to help them. Some of them will turn back. No. We're talking about a time of trouble, brothers and sisters. Oh, yes. Which will escalate to the great time of trouble. And that's when the plague shall hit. Beloved, just like Belshazzar led Babylon into national apostasy and national ruin, defying the God of heaven. This country, the United States, will lead this world into national, universal, national ruin. Notice what the pen of inspiration says. National apostasy will be followed by national ruin. When our nation in its legislative councils shall enact laws to bind the consciences of men in regard to their religious privileges, enforcing Sunday observance and bringing oppressive power to bear against those who keep the seventh day Sabbath, the law of God will to in all intents and purposes be made void in our land and national apostasy will be followed by national ruin. God is going to tear this place up. It goes on to say when the Protestant churches shall unite with the secular power to sustain a false religion for opposing which their ancestors endured the fiercest persecution. Then will the papal Sabbath be enforced by the combined authority of church and state. We see that coming together now. There will be a national apostasy again, which will end only in national ruin. And when the state shall use its power to enforce the decrees and sustain the institutions of the church, then will Protestant America have formed an image to the papacy. And there will be a national apostasy, which again will only end in national ruin. Beloved, I know this is something else. This sounds challenging. This sounds scary. But don't worry, no, don't worry. Our God is coming soon. Did you believe that? Notice what the pen of inspiration says here. As America, the land of the religious liberty, shall unite with the papacy in forcing the countries of compelling men to honor the false Sabbath, the people of every country on the globe will be led to follow her example. The Sabbath question is to be the issue in the great final conflict in which all the world will act the part. Yes, the whole world. Foreign nations will follow the examples of the United States, though she leads out. Yet the same crisis will come upon our people in all parts of the world. Beloved, we need not worry about all this. Not if you have a relationship with Jesus. Not if you love the Lord. You see, our God shall deliver us. 
You believe that? Say amen. Praise God. And there in his counsel, he tells us that he's going to deliver his people. When the protection of human law shall be withdrawn from those who honor the law of God, there will be in different lands a simultaneous movement of their destruction. As the time appointed in the decree draws near, the people will conspire to root out the hated sect. In other words, we're going to be hated if we stand for God. It will be determined to strike in one night a decisive blow, which shall utterly silence the voice of dissent and reproof. It goes on to say this, the people of God, some in prison cells, some in solitary retreats in the forests and the mountains still plead for divine protection, while in every quarter companies of armed men urged on by hosts of evil angels are preparing for the work of death. It is now in the hour of utmost extremity that the God of Israel will interpose for the deliver deliverance of his chosen people. Praise God, I say. God is not going to let us down. God is going to deliver us. Don't worry. Just follow the counsel. What do you say? Now as I close, as the music plays, brothers and sisters, we need to understand something now and make it plain upon the tables in your mind. The handwriting is on the wall. Yes, it is. The handwriting is there. It's going to come to pass. This national Sunday law movement, the one world order, you name it, you can readily see how they will be restricting our freedoms. Oh, yes. And there's the handwriting on the wall. It was there in ancient Babylon. The handwriting on the wall is here for this world, this global Babylon. Uh-huh. With its codes, yes, codes, to give allegiance to Rome. Ultimately, the devil, Satan himself. But we who are faithful, we who are faithful, need not worry. Why? Listen to these beautiful words of Jesus found in one of our favorite books, that great book, John chapter 14. And he says to us, you see these things, you see the handwriting on the wall, but let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions, and if it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again, oh yes, and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Oh, beloved, the coming of Jesus is even at the doors. Oh, yes, he's coming. The handwriting on the wall spells out that he's coming. He's nigh, even at the doors. The question is, will you be ready? Will you stand true? Will you take your stand, even if you have to stand alone? The God of heaven is calling your name right now. No matter where you are, near and far, those of you who are right here in my presence, those of you who are near and far, the God of heaven is calling your name right now. And he says, my son, my daughter, in this dark hour of earth's history, give me your whole heart. I want your whole heart. And I want you to know it's easier to be saved than to be lost. Oh, yes, all you got to do is give your heart completely to me. Praise God. He wants to give you the power of the Holy Spirit. It's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. And therefore, God is asking you and I to do his bidding by simply surrendering our will to him. The God of heaven is asking us to do this right now. No matter where you are right now, you may be thinking, Lord, I have not really given my all. I haven't done what you called me to do. I've studied your word. And I've, I've learned things even superficially. I haven't gotten deep in your word. As a matter of fact, I haven't even applied any of these things to my life by surrendering to your will. Forgive me, O oh God. And if that's your testimony, the God of heaven hears you. He knows your heart. He will accept you right now, right now, today. Right here, right now, he'll accept you. So bless his name. He's a great God. He's not willing that any should perish, but he's given us the counsel of what we are to do. 
We see what is happening in this world. We want to be saved. We want to leave this earth, but we have to do it God's appointed way. And that is first beginning to give our lives to him. And he says in that great book, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish by famine or pestilence, you name it, but they shall have everlasting life. And one of the things that we can do as remnant Christians in these last days, so many people are dying from this pandemic, brothers and sisters. So many people are dying, and it's a for real thing. Yes, they are dying, but I'm noticing something. There's something that I'm noticing. And most of these people that are dying, they're either up in age with physical disabilities and challenges, or they have a poor diet that has their body sick, and it's easy for them to catch and die from this pandemic. And just like those Hebrew boys in Daniel chapter 1 refused to eat the king's meat, it's time for us to be about our father's business with the health message. We need to share our faith and let people know if we take care of our bodies the way God say take care, of take care of it, we won't have all these diseases. And there in Exodus 15, 26, he says, none of these diseases I shall put on you. God says, go forward, my people, and share this truth to touch a life that is plagued by this pandemic. Why? Because the handwriting is on the wall. And today, if you hear his voice, hearten not your heart. Let's make our calling and election sure right now. Let's be serious about the things of God. Let's get ready to pack up and go. Jesus wants to take us home. And therefore, if you want prayer right now to rededicate your life to God, I want you to kneel with me no matter where you are, near and far, as we pray and call on God's name to bless us and seal our decisions today for him this day and forevermore. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you for your truth. We thank you for your word. Oh, God of heaven, we know that it shall stand forever. And Lord, we come, we come with hearts that is melting now because we want to do your bidding. We want to do your will. And yet, Lord, we look in the mirror and we cannot see how we can accomplish this. But if we take our eyes off ourselves and just simply fix our eyes on you, there's no way we won't make it. There's no way we won't be able to overcome. By beholding you, we shall become changed and become like you by surrendering all. So forgive us for our sins, trespasses, and iniquities. Give us the power of the Holy Spirit to follow your will and your way, Lord, completely. Help us, Lord, even when this prayer is concluded, that we will never turn back from you and join up with the devil again. Help us, O oh God, not to do that. And we want to thank you, O oh Lord, for hearing our petitions, and thank you, O oh God, for answering, answering our petitions, Lord, and, 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 and reading our hearts as we pray right now and surrender our will to you all over again. Lord, make us anew. Break us on the rock, Christ Jesus. Make us new again, piece by piece. And when you shall come in the clouds of glory, take us home with you. Therefore, we're giving you permission right now to prepare us to be ready. And Lord of heaven, thank you for saving us in your kingdom. This we pray in Jesus' name. Let everyone say amen, amen, and amen. May God bless you. May God keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and give you peace. Peace in your heart and peace in your home. God bless. Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name, Master.
there's something about that name. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's just something. At this time, let us bow our heads for our benediction. Father God, thank you for your blessings of your word. Thank you for your message and song. Thank you for the gifts that has been used today for your glory and worship to you. May your Holy Spirit go with us, fill us, and dwell with us, Lord, as we go forward by faith to be a true walking testimony of your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you, O God, for the blessing of the day. Now, as we depart, we shall move forward and go about to be a blessing to others. We give you the praise and thanks for this wonderful Sabbath day in communing with you. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. May God bless you. We'll see you next Sabbath.